All right, so the, the question that we are studying in my lab um, is how does something as complex as the brain um, form in the course of embryonic development? How do the first circuits develop? How do they become functionally active? Um, how do they perform the first computations and instruct the first behaviors? And so because all of these um, aspects are highly dynamic aspects, um, um, we, we spent quite a large fraction of our time actually also developing technology that allows us to visualize and also measure um, at the cellular level and, and uh, at even smaller scales what's happening um, uh, during, during the development and the emergence of function in the nervous system. And so um, I'd just like to start with two examples of microscopes and imaging assays we've developed uh, for this purpose. Um, what you can see here is um, a life imaging experiment with a nuclear labeled uh, Drosophila embryo going through embryogenesis. And um, we can basically follow um, all of the different cells um, as they move and divide and specifically reconstruct the formation of the early nervous system. So the sort of structure is the equivalent um, of, the, um, of the vertebrate spinal cord that's being formed here. So we have this, this lineage reconstruction and the you know, morpho morphodynamic building plan um, of the early nervous system. You now, complementing this developmental perspective, we also like to capture what's happening in the in the individual neurons once the nervous system is really up and running. Um, and so we need tools that are even faster. Um, now we're imaging at 100 times higher speed and even larger volume. This is the, the brain of the lava zebra fish. Uh, we have about 100,000 neurons. And using calcium indicators, we can, uh, we can follow the activity um, uh, during different types of behaviors. And so from these whole brain function imaging uh, recordings, we can then figure out what kind of circuits are involved in certain types of behaviors um, and what kind of networks across the brain are, are communicating with each other and are jointly involved in certain types of computations. And so um, I, I chose these two examples also because in both of these cases, these imaging experiments marked the first time that an analysis like this was possible. This was the first time that um, we could actually track cells systematically across a high-end vertebrate and the first time that we could image neural activity at the cellular level um, across a vertebrate brain. And what's, what's made it possible to do these types of, uh, um, you know, to record these types of data sets to do these types of analysis is the, is the concept of light sheet microscopy. So I'll, I'd just like to remind you very briefly what the, the key concept is behind this technique. Um, it's actually a very old technique. It's been around for more than 100 years. It makes us twice as, twice as old as confocal microscopy. And to the present day, um, you know, the fundamental concept has basically remained the same. What we're doing is we're illuminating a, a, a sample with a thin sheet of light, uh, of laser light that we are that is entering the sample chamber from the side. So we're selectively illuminating a thin volume section in the sample. And then the fluorescence that is emitted by the thin section um, is imaged with a conventional wide field detection subsystem oriented at a right angle to this incident light sheet. So we have this, this, um, this detection objective and then a camera further, further up in that arm that takes a snapshot of that plane of that thin section. And so that makes this technique a very fast imaging technique because we can, with one snapshot, we can capture millions of volume elements across this plane. Um, and we can do rapid 3D imaging by just moving the light sheet through the sample step by step, just recording the image sequence. Um, and so then we're basically just limited by the, by the speed of the detector, the camera. Um, we can get gigavoxels per second with, with modern SCMOS cameras. But it's also a very gentle technique. Um, and so it's gentle because we are only sending light exactly to the part of the sample that we're taking the image of at any point in time. We're not sending light to out-of-focus regions. Um, we're not bleaching or damaging parts out of focus. And so this combination is really important for our work. And so now I'd like to be a little bit more quantitative about the imaging experiments I just showed you on the first two slides. Um, and as a reference, um, you know, just in, in, you know, embed this um, basically embed these experiments in, in, in a parameter space that we would care about a lot in, in most of these live imaging experiments. We're looking at the size of the sample we can image, the duration for which we can image it, and, and the spatial and temporal resolution we can achieve. And so as a reference point, now just connecting to, to Daniel's talk again, I think Daniel made this, this nice point that if you use a state-of-the-art spinning disk uh, confocal microscope, a very powerful, you know, fast imaging device, you can still kind of do this experiment of, of tracking cells in a, in a C. elegans embryo, but only up to a certain point of time. If you go too far into development, and, and the, the embryo moves so quickly that you can't follow these cells anymore. But so this is kind of like at the limit of the performance of the system. And so that puts us somewhere here in this parameter space. And so I'm, I'm sure you've heard of the work um, of my colleague, Eric Betzig at Chanelia, who is also using light microscopy to push 
spatial resolution um, in, in these experiments. And it, so he is able to get these really dramatic improvements in spatial resolution of more than a factor of 10, same model system. And so using these really, really thin light sheets, either using Bessel beams or lattice light sheet techniques. So for us, the challenge has been a different one. Um, we wanted to stay at the single cell level, but scale this up to a much, much larger uh, model system. So for the Drosophilam, we were imaging at 1,000 times larger volume. We still want to follow cells at the same speed, at the same volume rate. And then if you push it into the functional realm, um, we need to image not only a 1,000 times larger volume, but also image that volume at a 100-fold faster volume rate. So this is where light microscopy has been really helpful to us. But if you look at these different data points in this plot, there's one thing that's really unsatisfying about it, and that's there's seemingly, the implication here is that there, there's seemingly this, this trade-off. You know, you can either image a fairly small sample at very high resolution, or a fairly large volume, you know, sort of at, 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 cell, at a cellular level very, very, very quickly, but you can't do both at the same time. And so I think what we really want is a technique that allows us to image a, a fairly large volume, you know, like, a, like at the brain of a, of a, of a larval zebrafish, over long periods of time, um, um, over the mental time scales, you know, during, during behaviors, um, at both at high spatial and high temporal resolution. And so, so I'd like to show you first this and basically how we can get to this part in the parameter space. And so the, the, the goal here is really to find a way um, to add this fourth parameter and you know, three out of the four parameters we're kind of happy with. We have the large volume, we have the high speed. Um, uh, you know, but, but what is missing is the spatial resolution. So how we can add, how can we add spatial resolution to this mix without uh, trading off, um, sacrificing any other parameter? So, well, let's look at the challenge first. What's the problem we need to solve? The reason why spatial resolution is not as high as we would want it to be in these experiments is that we suffer in, in many light microscopes, in fact, from anisotropic spatial resolution. So the problem here is that we are not really collecting all of the light that is provided by our object. Um, so you have a limited, limited numerical aperture, only collecting light under a certain small angular range. And so this anis anisotropy and sampling information um, results in an anisotropy in the way in which we form the image and represent the, uh, represent the, the samples. So we have typically much lower axial resolution than lateral resolution, as Daniel pointed out earlier. So ideally what you would want to have is axial resolution be as good as lateral resolution. Um, so that would be a big step forward. I mean, light microscopy often has a factor of 10 that we're talking about. Um, and then on top of that, it would be biologically much more meaningful because we're treating all of the dimensions the same way, which makes much more sense. So what we need to find now is a way to solve this problem without compromising any of the other aspects of our performance because for our experiments, it's really important that we can maintain the high temporal resolutions. We can still stay in the realm of calcium imaging, you know, maybe even push this forward towards voltage imaging in the future. So we really don't want to touch speed and still you know, get imaging at the, at the whole brain level. So the way we can do this um, is that we, we combine light sheet imaging with another a uh, fairly old concept, and that's the concept of multi-view imaging. Um, so what we do in this, in, in this approach is that counterintuitively, the first, uh, you know, first step is that we don't solve this problem of anisotropic resolution. We simply accept the fact that if, let's say, if you have a point-like object, we image that, we get this ellipsoid, so like this distorted representation. Um, so we have low resolution along the axial component, high resolution laterally. But then in the next step, what we do is we rotate the sample by 90 degrees relative to the, to, the, to the microscope. And so we record a second view of the same scene. And so now we have permuted the dimensions along which resolution is high and low respectively. And taken together across these two images, we have actually all, almost all of the frequency content that we're interested in um, of our sample. And we basically just have to register these two views, uh, combine them, for example, for a process called multi-view deconvolution, and then we have this neisotropic spatial resolution. So, so that would be a powerful way to improve spatial resolution because we can just keep our microscope um, and, and our, the way in which we build our light sheets the way it is. And we just, basically the main challenge that we have to solve now is to find a way to record these multiple views at the same time. Then we haven't you know, sacrificed temporal resolution. And so Raghav Chichi, a postdoc in my lab, addressed this problem and built a microscope that can do that. And so here's the idea. Um, it's a little bit, the arrangement is a little bit more complex than this, this basic idea that I described. So we don't ha only have two views of the sample. We actually have four opposing objectives. Um, so it gives us four formal views, um, that which simply means that we can scale this idea up to larger specimens that are not entirely transparent. 
Um, so for Drosophila and Zebra, which is actually very helpful also for mouse, mouse embryos that we are studying. But now the, the problem is if we send in four light sheets at the same time from all these four objectives and then take four images, right field images with these objectives, we violated the fundamental concept of um, the, the optical uh, sectioning um, uh, concept in light sheet microscopy. So we, we've actually sent in light in a way that we now illuminate out of focus structures with respect to uh, the respective other light sheets. So we get out of focus light, we, we basically degrade image quality um, by doing this at the same time. So the way we can solve this is that we don't actually use light sheets in our light sheet microscopes. Um, what we do is we send in a very, very thin pencil beam. Um, and so then if you take this pencil beam and you, you scan it up and down very quickly um, across your plane of interest and you just keep the camera shut to open, you get the equivalent of a light sheet. And so you have a scanned light sheet. Um, and so what, you know, if you use this concept now and uh, it, it, implement it in a way that the, the, the beams that come in from these different views are slightly offset in space, um, so we keep them maybe a couple of tens of microns apart, and then we scan them across their respective planes at a constant pace, so they maintain that same constant distance, so they never cross their paths in real space, then all we need to do is match this up with a set of confocal line detectors that really only detect the light that comes from that beam and blocks out the, the light that comes from the orthogonal beam that's slightly offset in space. It's just hitting the detector at the wrong spot, not where the rolling shot is at that at point in time. We have the same phase offset in our confocal line detectors. Everything is matched up and synchronized, um, and now we can scan four views at the same time without any signal crosstalk. So that's the key idea in what we call the isotropic multi-view light sheet microscope, the ICU microscope. And so here's the data we can get with this approach. Um, again, so like the, the low anisotropic resolution in the contributing views, but if you combine these views into, a, into one single image, this is the multi-view deconvolved image, we now have isotropic resolution. You can turn this in any way, and, um, and you, know, you don't have any perceived difference in spatial resolution. This is a, um, a G-camp expressing uh, Trosophila lava, you know, it actually comes throughout the entire nervous system. And so let me just zoom in on, onto this cluster of neurons so you can actually see the impact on spatial resolution. Um, so in our contributing views, we have one dimension along which it's very hard to distinguish these individual neurons. They're just blurring into each other. In the other set of views, it's a different dimension, but same, the same problem. But then combining all this information into the ice view reconstruction, we now have high resolution from any view, you know, this along the x, x, y, c, and axes. Um, and so we basically restored cellular resolution even in these deeper regions of the nervous system. And so overall, we find we have about 400 nanometer spatial resolution. And so because we haven't sacrificed temporal resolution, we can now do these types of functional imaging experiments, where, for example, imaging at the whole animal level, the entire um, Drosophila lama expressed in cheek camp during motor behavior, as you can see forward, backward crawling, and then sort of concurrent calcium activity that is sort of orchestrating this, this, be, this behavior uh, in the ventral nerve cores. So you, you see these waves um, in the VNC, and um, sort of a similar context in the zebrafish. So we have a, a lava zebrafish here that ex executing different types of swimming behaviors, and you can see this activity in the hindbrain and the spinal cord during these behaviors. Now, so this is imaged at two hertz, and this is at one hertz. And it's just rotating the fish here, so you can see if it, there's no change in resolution as we rotate the, uh, the volume. So I think live imaging is where this really unfolds its full potential. Uh, but you can, of course, also use it for structural imaging experiments with fixed samples. Um, and so the, so the main gain here is that you, you get isotropic resolution. You can image it very quickly. Um, so this is now an expanded Drosophila brain you know, combined with expansion microscopy. Um, so that makes it actually about you know, two millimeters um, uh, long along each side. Um, and so within about 15 minutes, we get then 100 nanometer isotropic spatial resolution across the brain. There's sort of like a sparse pattern of uh, fruitless neurons that are labeled here. And so if you zoom in, you can see the fine structural details, which can aid conectomics types analysis um, in, in relatively high throughput with these imaging experiments. So let me just uh, summarize this. We have basically an improvement of about tenfold in resolution without sacrificing speed and field of view. And in, more, in, more, in more absolute quantitative terms, that means 400 nanometer spatial resolution, system resolution, um, at sub-second time scales for a volume of about 800 micron cubed. And so I just showed you very short sequences from actually longer imaging experiments. We've imaged these samples for hours to days in each of these cases. So you can use it under physiological conditions in this parameter space. But one thing I'd like to point out is that intentionally I said system resolution here. So which means this is the performance we expect on ideal imaging conditions if you have a fairly transparent sample. And um, 
Unfortunately, most of the samples we're looking at are far from transparent, and you know, we end up in this realm of imaging relatively large uh, specimens for live imaging, um, Drosophila uh, lava, zebrafish brain. Um, they actually perturb the light that we need to use to rely on to do the measurement in the first place. Um, and so this is a problem we need to solve because the way it impacts our light sheet microscope is that because of the heterogeneity, the optical heterogeneity of the samples, it's kind of like this toy model of a cross-section of, of uh, let's say, this, this, this of the lava. Um, as the light sheets enter the sample, they are deviated from their light path uh, to change their course. Um, and so this can change further inside the sample depending on the optical properties, can change over time, you know, as optical properties change as the sample develops. And the same thing happens in the detection process. So we have, so we increasing curvature of the focal planes. They're not really clean planes anymore. They, they get, they get bent as a function of the spatial location and as a function of time. And so bottom line is that we lose, we lose this, you know, nice coplanarity that we rely on in the light sheet microscope. But if the light sheet should be, you know, coplanar with a focal plane to get an in-focus image, that's not really the case anymore, so we basically image out of focus and we get low resolution and low image contrast. And so, so Loic Royer, another postdoc in the lab, um, um, addressed this problem in the following way. I basically developed, first of all, so there the, are the two components to this, to this solution. First of all, we need a microscope that has access to the degrees of freedom that we needed to bend things back into shape. We need to be able to rotate and translate the light sheets and the focal planes so we can actually fix the problem if we know what the problem is geometrically. And so the, the second part is that we need to measure, take the right measurements. We have um, algorithms deployed um, on the microscope that allow us to, to estimate image quality as a function of changes in these, in these degrees of freedom and basically build a model of the sample in the, back, in the background of the live imaging experiment to constantly improve in space and time the spatial relationship between uh, focal planes and light sheets. And so with this combined sort of adaptive imaging approach, um, we can now hand the experiment over to, uh, to this, to this um, real-time control layer and um, basically have it optimize the uh, image, image quality. And so in a, for example, in a, in a zebrafish embryo that has the following effect. We have, if you look at different regions here, we're trying to track the cells as they form the nervous system. Um, we can't really, without the adaptive imaging, follow cells in many parts of the sample anymore over time, just image quality degrades. And uh, with the adaptive imaging approach, we can recover that high resolution. Um, we can also use it in a functional imaging context. Um, so this is now um, a zebrafish larval brain. Um, again, I'm showing you the quality with the adaptive imaging engaged and, and, and without this framework. And after some time of, of imaging, you can see how quality really degrades because the, the brain is growing, the fish is actually growing, and we're changing the optical, con uh, the, the optical context and losing the ability to uh, really accurately measure activity at a single neuron level. And with that, I'm at the end. Um, just like to give you a quick outlook, we. Um, are now integrating these imaging tools with optical manipulation tools. We don't only want to watch what's happening, we want to control what's happening, manipulate it. And so particularly with a, with a layer that allows us to classify behavior in real time so that we can in, you know, interact with behavior at different stages, at different phases, and for example, control the state that the network is in, control, for example, motor behavior from forward walking to backward walking and so on. And so that's the next stage now for this technology for us. And so with that, I'm at the end of the talk. And just like to acknowledge very briefly uh, Raghav Chichu, who built the ISOV microscope, Lloyd Royer, who developed this adaptive imaging framework, built did a lot of the imaging experiments, helped, helped a lot with these imaging experiments. And then we have a lot of fantastic collaborators at Chenelia that contributed a lot to the work that I showed you here, Misha Arns and Kristen Branson in particular, uh, to whom I'm very grateful. All right, thank you.